This is Duke University. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Thank you all for coming. It's really terrific to see everyone here on a Friday afternoon. Beautiful, uh, beautiful day as well. And uh, we're really grateful to all of you for coming and to our three guests for uh, coming back, back home to Duke Law School to share their experiences with you. Um, but before I introduce them and thank them, I want to thank especially Oleg Kobolev from the International Careers Office who has organized this event and who um, uh, in general is organizing the Lives in International Law Speaker Series and working with me and Jennifer Marr, uh, who's here, um, working on all a variety of endeavors to uh, support international career paths here at Duke Law School. And so, as I said the other day to any of you who are at the JDLM um, uh, lunch curriculum briefing this past week, if there are additional kinds of speakers you would like to have or specific individuals you may know, um, let us know. Email Oleg or, or, uh, or me or uh, Dean Marr and we can try to, um, to organize that. Uh, this is, the I think, the second in our series of Lives International Law this fall. Uh, we had the first last Friday with Jonathan Kellner from S the Skadden office in Sao Paulo. And we will have another one on October 17th with Ryan Melsky, who has been working in Costa Rica uh, for the RES law firm. Today, we're really uh, delighted to have three, um, three of our illustrious uh, alums who work in a, an interesting diversity of international law fields. And I'm just going to give just a, the uh, tip of the iceberg of each of their uh, bios and uh, because they're going to speak about themselves and about their uh, career paths, the kind of work they do, and I'll let them say most of that. Uh, <clears throat> but uh, first, uh, to my immediate right, Amber Jordan, who's uh, class of 2010 in the JDLLM program and is now f in her second year as a law clerk on the uh, U.S. Court of International Trade, which is in New York. Um, and she may, I'll let her uh, mention, she may now be moving to uh, continue that clerkship in a, uh, another jurisdiction. Um, but the Court of International Trade is a special court, as you may know, uh, for um, uh, litigation about international tr or arising under international trade law and international trade agreements. And so it's a, um, an especially uh, interesting window onto the whole world of globalization, international trade law, and how it's then implemented in or affects uh, domestic institutions and, uh, and parties, businesses, and others who are affected by international trade law. Then sitting in the middle is Mike Gillis. Mike is also class of 2010 uh, JDLLM alum. When Mike was here, he was co-president of the International Law Society. And uh, both uh, Amber and Mike were heavily involved in a variety of student organization activities here. And Mike um, is now working at the State Department uh, in State L, the Office of the Legal Advisor, where he has uh, been working on uh, buildings and acquisitions, as he'll tell you, and I was just, we were just laughing about the issue of if the State Department is going to buy a new building and, or build a new building someplace in the world, the security restrictions that must be involved with uh, all the personnel from the most senior to the most uh, uh, rudimentary uh, who have to work on, who have access to that building. There was a famous case 15 or 20 years ago in which the U.S. Embassy in Moscow and the Russian Embassy in Washington, D.C. turned out to have uh, all sorts of electronic eavesdropping uh, had been somehow uh, uh, in the walls of the buildings. I, th I think I have that roughly right. Okay, and then the la our last speaker is um, Coulter Lathrop, class of 2006 um, in the JDLM program as well. And, but Coulter had worked before law school for several years and had created his own consultancy and now can be also a, a, a lawyer in, uh, as well as an expert in the same kind of work on the consultancy called Sovereign Geographic, uh, helping countries, I think most or all of your clients are national governments, 
who have uh, maritime boundary disputes. So that, for example, their, um, uh, their 12 or 200 mile zones overlap with, because of the shape of the, of the coastline, they overlap with the 12 or 200 mile zones of neighboring countries. And there might be valuable mineral deposits or shipping lanes or something else in those, um, in those uh, overlapping zones. And that leads to litigation in international tribunals. So um, we're really thrilled to have all of you here. I think we'll, uh, we have uh, an hour and a half. We have until 5 o'clock. So maybe if each of you could speak for 10 or 12 minutes, roughly, about uh, what, how you got to where you're doing, but also interesting kinds of things you've been doing. And then we can have more open discussion. So let me start with Amber, and we'll sure. go across. Thanks so much. Hey, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, as um, it was mentioned, I graduated. Um, we graduated actually together in 2010 from the JDLM program. Um, while I was here at the law school, um, I was involved um, uh, in a number of activities. Um, all three years, I was part of the WTO moot court competition. Um, my 1L year, I competed. Um, my 2L year, I coached. Um, my 3L year, oh, we co-coached together, and he was on the team, actually, in the 2L year. Um, which was a phenomenal opportunity. I was also a co-director of RASP. I was involved in PILF, um, uh, various um, international leading, you know, leading types of activities while I was here. Um, my 2L summer, um, because it all, all of this added together to get me where I am right now, my 2L summer, I split between Hug and LaBelle, it was Hug and Hearts at a time in their trade department in DC. Then I went to the Government Accountability Office and worked in their trade department and their procurement department. Um, I uh, applied to the Court of International Trade. Um, I, I, I was a, I am a JDLLM, um, but a friend of mine actually mentioned the Court of International Trade to me and I was like, the Court of what? Um, <laughs> uh, he knew I was interested um, in doing trade and so I started looking into it. I've never heard of this court. And, um, so three all year I applied, and I only applied to that court. I, I didn't really have an interest in clerking um, outside of trade. I wanted to do trade, so I was going to go back and do trade at Hogan, or I was going to, you know, go and clerk uh, for the court. Um, ended up uh, getting the job. I worked for uh, Judge Evan Wallach, who's been on the court for 15 years. Um, our court is interesting. Um, I, I'm going to presume you don't know, because why should you? Um, it's interesting. It's an Article Three court. Um, with full powers of law and equity, as he likes to remind me so often. Um, and uh, we are strange in that we have, uh, we act as both a trial court and an appellate court, depending on the cases that come before us. Um, it's almost all administrative law. I think it's, I mean, it is international trade, but it's almost all international, uh, administrative law. Um, if the majority of the cases we get come up from the Department of Commerce and the International Trade Commission when they jointly determine anti-dumping duties or countervailing measures. The majority of the cases come from China. I would say anti-dumping countervailing from China makes up about 70% of our docket. Um, the other cases, and that's that's straight up Chevron deference. You know, it's 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 straight admin law. Um, then other cases come up before us from customs, customs classification case. That's de novo review. We hold trials. Um, we're finders of fact. Um, so it's a, it's a strange court. Um, it has international um, subject matter jurisdiction. So, uh, well, national, it's across the entire nation. Um, all trade cases come to us um, with regards to imports. Um, and, but that's all we do. That completely is just trade. Um, my judge was recently nominated by uh, President Obama to go to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit. Um, in case you don't know, the Court of International Trade appeals up to the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, which appeals up to the Supreme Court. Uh, the Court of Appeals for the Federal Circuit, if you don't know, um, also has a uh, subject matter national jurisdiction. Um, the CIT cases, the trade cases they receive, only make up about 3 4% of their docket. And the majority of the CEFC's docket is actually patent law. Um, so the judge wants me to go with him there uh, for a couple of years. Um, so I'm actually moving out of, of, of international trade right now um, and transitioning uh, to patent. And if any of you know anything about patent, you can tell me after. Um, and, um, but that's a very exciting opportunity. Um, we're probably going to go down uh, to DC to do that court in a couple of months. Um, so that is going to uh, uh, be a, a pretty extensive transition. And I think that's probably all I have right now.
You want me to look at your notes and copy it? Yeah, that's No? Good. Okay, go ahead. And to show you how prepared I am, I'm not even going to use you, Oh, bold, <laughs> bold. <laughs> Um, hi, folks. Thank you, uh, Professor Weiner and uh, Dean Marr and, and Oleg for having us here. Um, uh, as Professor Weiner said, uh, my name is Mike Gillis. I was also class of 2010 in the JDLM program with Amber. Um, and I came to Duke Law uh, after having uh, majored in Latin American studies in college, uh, having spent some time living abroad uh, in Brazil and Angola, um, and uh, working in New York um, doing criminal justice policy research, um, and also as a paralegal. Um, so I came to law school with some international experience, some legal experience, and the the general sense that, uh, obviously, having applied to the inter to the JDLM program, that I wanted to do something that combined those two things into international law. Um, what I didn't really know what was what international law entailed, um, and some of you may have been or may still be in the same situation. And I think, hopefully, in this series of uh, lives in the law that you will be attending diligently, um, don't miss one. I don't know, maybe Ole should give out like a punch card. Or you should, I don't know. Um, but you will, you will discover that, that international law is both extremely broad and also almost always a misnomer. Um, there are very few places, even in the State Department, as I'll try and explain, where what you practice is purely international law. A lot of it is domestic law, administrative law, foreign relations law that has an international component to it. Um, so here at Duke, uh, I did a lot of things. Um, I was on the mock trial and moot court boards. I was on the WTO moot court team, um, which Amber competed on the year before I joined, and then Amber was my coach. Um, I was on the Duke Law Journal. And they did very well. They came in second in the world. Yes. I just want to let you know. Uh, they were second. <laughs> And Duke very generously paid for us to go to Taipei and uh, compete, which um, I suggest all of you find a way to do that. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was on the Duke Law Journal. I was, uh, as, as Professor Wiener mentioned, um, uh, co-chair of the International Law Society, um, ha helped coordinate the public interest retreat, um, and basically tried to stay as busy as possible, and I think I probably succeeded or came pretty close. Um, my 1L summer, I uh, was at the, I actually was here uh, TAing for Professor Weistart, who uh, was teaching summer contracts, and then went to the Summer Institute in Geneva. Uh, my 2L summer, I also split my summer between the State Department and uh, Williams and Connolly in Washington, D.C. Um, and then uh, immediately after I got back to Duke that fall, um, the State Department does not move as quickly as law firms do to make offers, and they also don't have sort of an automatic, if you were an intern, you get a job set up that used to be the norm uh, for, <laughs> for law firm hiring. Hopefully it's getting back to being the norm after a couple rough years there. Uh, but uh, so I spent most of my 3L fall pestering people at the State Department um, and telling them that I really wanted to work for them and they should hire me. Um, and they eventually gave in and uh, <laughs> made me an offer, uh, which uh, was really nice, especially as somebody who was getting off the firm track. A lot of my friends who were taking other public interest positions had to wait until the spring or even until after they had graduated and passed the bar to apply or, or be considered for a lot of non-law firm positions. So it was nice to have been able to get the public interest job that I wanted, but to have done it early enough in the year that I could really enjoy my last few months of law school uh, in a way that people who were still job hunting were not necessarily able to. Um, now that I am at the State Department, Al is basically the office of the general counsel for the State Department um, and is organized into uh, different divisions that roughly have internal clients within the State Department. Uh, so Al handles everything from what 
I don't know, what I consider to be sort of the sexy international law things like being on uh, international delegations that negotiate arms control treaties, um, uh, you know, those sorts of things to uh, when somebody files a equal employment discrimination case against the State Department or uh, even slips and falls on State Department property, you know, we handle that too. Um, and then there's things like what I do, which are sort of somewhere in between the, those two extremes, um, which uh, is handling international real estate transactions for the department. Um, so what that entails is it's basically being, and in retrospect, I probably should have taken a transactional or sort of commercial law class because I'm basically a corporate transactional attorney. I spend my days reading contracts, drafting contracts, um, basically opining to my internal clients as to whether the language that they have chosen for this lease or purchase or sale um, is going to violate any U.S. laws that we have to be aware of or is going to compromise any of our uh, international uh, rights. Um, particularly, I look out for accidentally waiving sovereign immunity, uh, which is something we try not to do. Uh, <laughs> it comes up quite a bit. You might be surprised. Uh, there are also again, domestic laws that uh, apply to all U.S. government contracting that we have to be aware of, um, that I have to keep an eye on. Luckily for me, I, I, I counted the other day, you know, I have 90 different, I organize my email by country, and I have right now 90 some different country folders in my email. So I work in, in any given day probably on an issue, small or big, in 10 or 15 different places. Um, I'm not an expert on American property law, much less Bangladeshi or Burmese or uh, Congolese or wherever. So I get to hire local attorneys in all these places if I need them who can advise me on, you know, how do you register a deed in this country, you know, do these standard provisions that we use violate your local laws in a way that, you know, we need to be aware of. Um, so I get to focus more on big picture risk analysis, which is something that I think lawyers do a lot that doesn't necessarily get talked about when you're learning doctrinal law, um, except maybe in uh, Professor Wiener's <laughs> decision making classes. Uh, risk analysis. Yeah, uh, but you know, my I, you know I don't so much say like yes this is legal or no this is illegal. Sometimes I get to do that, but often I'm asked to provide an opinion about you know if we do this you know in the real world. How likely is it that we will be sued? And if we get sued, then how likely is it that we'll lose? And is that worth, you know, doing it because it has these tangible benefits to us right now of X, Y, and Z? Um, and that's something that um, took me a little while to figure out uh, that I now really enjoy about my job. It's not, you know, so much um, the standard legal memo that you, uh, you know, are writing in uh, legal writing. Although I have written things that look exactly like that, but a lot of times it's, you know, just providing sort of with a lawyer's eye um, my opinion on, on whether the United States government should or shouldn't do what, uh, what it is seeking uh, to do. So I feel pretty lucky to be able to do that. Um, and the other thing I should mention uh, real quickly is that um, Al has sort of a rotational system that's similar to what the Foreign Service does overseas. We, Al has almost everybody based in Washington. We only have maybe five or six people that are posted overseas. But what we do do is every two to six years, they expect us to move internally from one division to another. So I'll spend a couple years doing real estate, and then based on my preferences and who else is moving and whatever black box they use, um, I'll have the opportunity to rotate to doing some other type of law completely, um, whether it's working on international trade agreements or litigating passport cases or handling FOIA requests or any of the other hundreds of things that constitute practicing law for the Department of State. And I'm excited about that too because it means that I can effectively have several different legal careers without having to 
actually go out and find a new job and, and roll over my 401k. So. Cool. Okay. 401k. Well, that's it. <laughs> if you really want to know what the government you. benefits are like, it's, it's, it's similar to a 401k. It's called the thrift spending account. Ah, uh, yes. <laughs> Foreign yeah. to a solo practitioner. Um, <laughs> I, uh, well, thank you for the introduction and for the opportunity to uh, address this group, and thanks to all of you for coming. Um, I practice pure public international law, uh, interstate disputes, mostly over maritime boundary delimitation, some territorial sovereignty disputes, um, some transboundary harm disputes as well. And I do that as a solo practitioner living in Asheville, North Carolina, and practicing under the trade name Sovereign Geographic. Uh, I'll tell you a little bit about how I got to that point. I could tell you a little bit about what I do in that capacity. And if I remember, I'll give you some tips on how to, how to uh, enter the world of international law. I started in 1994 a master's program in marine policy at the University of Washington. And part of that program involved a thesis. I was taking a Law of the Sea class at the law school. I wasn't in a law program, but I was taking that class, and I had to write um, this thesis and, and found this idea of maritime boundary delimitation to be sort of interesting. And the Law of the Sea Convention doesn't contain much guidance on how one delimits maritime boundaries, as with many of these international conventions. This was a negotiated text by committee with no uh, particular meaning that anybody can discern. So I looked more closely at, at the, the legal provisions and, and brought in geography and geodesy and some of the technical aspects that might be involved in the process of creating a boundary. Wrote a thesis combining these two things on the technical aspects of boundary delimitation and then went out and sold that uh, expertise that I developed in the process of researching and writing on this topic. Uh, in the process, I landed a job with a, a law firm in Washington, D.C. It was LaBeouf Lamb. It's Dewey and LaBeouf now. Uh, as an in-house consultant, I wasn't a lawyer uh, at the time, and I was an in-house consultant providing this expertise that I had developed to the law firm and to their sovereign clients who had boundary disputes around the world. I did that for two years, billed my hours, and then got out, moved down to North Carolina from D.C., and hung out my own shingle as this expert in international maritime boundary delimitation, an expert albeit without a law degree. My mentor at the time said, you know, you really, you really ought to get a law degree. <laughs> uh, I'd already been to the world court with a client as the technical and uh, geographic analyst for that client. <laughs> So I'd seen the process, and I'd seen how much fun the lawyers have drafting and standing at the podium and addressing the court and developing the strategy. And I was relegated to pushing the PowerPoint buttons on the map presentations that I'd created. Uh, I, I, had a, I had a substantial role, but not one that was very high level or very uh, public. And so I took this person's advice, and I applied to Duke's Law School. I applied to Carolina as well, but uh, decided to go to Duke. So I came here in 03, I guess, and got out in 06. That I know I got out in 06, um, and I tried out for the Jessup Moot Court uh, team, having just been at the World Court, I figured since this was a Moot uh, Court uh, experience that was supposed to mimic the, the World Court, I didn't really get the idea of the Moot part. I prepared a speech, which is what you do at these big tribunals. It's not a hot bench. It's the coldest, coldest bench <laughs> you've ever seen, and I stood at the podium and started reading my speech and, and of course, got got nailed. Um, <laughs> and afterwards came to some realization what the process was really meant to be. And I, I, I told the guys, you know, I said, well, yeah, I was just at the court and that's not how they do it there. He said, nobody from Duke Law is ever going to practice at the World Court. That's our dirty little secret. So Mike and I had the, the privilege of representing Costa Rica at the World Court uh, last October yeah. um, in an intervention case, in an ongoing case between Nicaragua and Colombia. I can't remember this guy's name who said that, but I'd like to get in touch with him. <laughs> um, so uh, in any event, I graduated in 06 and, and was able just very recently to turn the corner from the, the analyst and uh, expert in, in non-legal aspects of these cases into counsel for countries before these various tribunals. Um, that's uh, the, the short story. I'd say in terms of any tips or advice, if you want to be in international law, get your foreign language abilities up. Uh, if you can develop or maintain fluency in a language other than English, 
you're going to separate yourselves from the field. Um, and then make yourself an expert in something through the process of publishing a piece. It, it, follow a curiosity. It doesn't have to be obvious that it's going to lead to a career, uh, but through the process of really investigating something as an academic um, and putting it out there, you'll have developed a, a small, probably, body of expertise, and you'll have a calling card. Anybody can print out business cards on a computer. That's what I did the first time I went. Yeah, here's my business card. Well, nobody really cares about that. Here's, here's a piece that's gone through a peer review process on a topic that you, Mr. and Mrs. Attorney, uh, deal with every day, and I can help you with that because I've got proof right here that I know what I'm talking about. So those would be my pieces of advice, probably really for uh, anybody who wants to um, really excel in law, but especially in the field of international law. Develop a narrow area of expertise, or at least an area of expertise, and get the foreign language skills uh, up to par. Well, thanks. That was, that was a great uh, beginning. I wonder if I could ask you each, I don't know if, Amber, you can do this, but to talk a little bit about a case that you uh, or, you've been handling. I don't know if you can speak about cases that were before the, the CIT. I, I, I can talk about cases and I, and I've I, done that yeah. I've finished. And I want, right, that, that, yeah. that have been yeah. decided. And cases that, and, and the, this Costa Rica case that Coulter and Mike, before you went to the State Department, uh, so that was during law school or just after graduation? That was uh, just after graduation. Um, yeah. I had the pleasure of, uh, to, no, uh, I, it was pleasurable. <laughs> uh, I, had, I had the pleasure of taking Coulter's class that he teaches here occasionally on uh, uh, international environmental law. Um, and around the same time that we were introduced to each other through the course, Coulter was looking for uh, a research assistant and then just sort of a personal assistant to help him with this intervention case for uh, for Costa Rica and so um, just because of the way the court schedule worked out um, I ended up being the most help during the period right after graduation um, and actually had to push my start date at the State Department back a couple weeks so that I could get to The Hague and back um, to... So, so what was that case about? Tell us um, a little bit about Nicaragua uh, uh, sued Colombia for uh, over a sovereignty dispute over some small islands in the Southwest Caribbean and uh, over their maritime boundary that would result once that sovereignty dispute was resolved. Costa Rica is in the region and could see from the pleadings, which they gained access to, that the claims of the parties were overlapping areas that Costa Rica felt, uh, maritime areas that Costa Rica um, felt it had a good claim to. And so it attempted to intervene in the case in order to protect those interests. It wanted to inform the court of the extent of its maritime area from its perspective. Um, and if it had been successful, if we had been successful in actually intervening, Costa Rica would have become a, a non-party third state in the main proceeding. Um, that didn't work out, as it turns out. Lost, lost my first case. But uh, from the client's perspective, it was, it was uh, the, the goal was to inform the court of its, of its claims in the area, which it did manage to do in this process. So you could lose the intervention but still win the, in the we, sense that the court's opinion could still respect those interests? Well, the court issued an opinion on our intervention attempt, and in that judgment said, just that, that we, we, we hear you, but you can't come in. <laughs> <laughs> and so when you're representing a country in, in this international tribunal, the country or the government is your client, with whom are you actually speaking? You know, what, you when you go to meetings in... Mike was there. Sure. So he well, it's, and it's there. interesting now being on what would theoretically be the client side, yes. although the United States and a handful of other countries are among the few countries that have the capacity to staff these kinds of cases entirely in-house. Um, Costa Rica and most other countries rely on a very small network of experienced practitioners who basically specialize in the ICJ docket, among other international tribunals, and Coulter is uh, 
inserting himself now into that, that pantheon. Um, but uh, our interaction was with attorneys from the Costa Rican Foreign Ministry, which is their equivalent of the State Department. So basically, me working in the Costa Rican, me now working in the Costa Rican government, hiring uh, you know these outside experts um, to to represent us. And the the way that the representation works at the court is that um, the submissions during the oral proceedings are made over the course of several hours uh, and almost invariably involve presentations from multiple advocates. So Coulter provided expertise to the legal team that Costa Rica brought, uh, made one of the main submissions, but there were also submissions that were made by the Costa Rican attorneys um, themselves. And similarly, Nicaragua and Colombia had legal teams that included um, both foreign, actually all exclusively foreign uh, uh, advocates. Um, and then there's the other sort of interesting thing about international law is that it maintains a lot of very um, <coughs> formal trappings. Uh, and so there is also a, a custom at the international court that you know each presentation needs to be introduced by an agent for the state. Um, and so that is a high-ranking diplomat from that country who sort of introduces his country and, and his legal team to the court um, in sort of a formal capacity. Amber, sorry. Um, sure, yeah. Um, we're in a safe space, right? Oh, we love this shit. We're such nerds. Um, I'll tell you about one of my favorite <laughs> we're, cases. We're being recorded? Yeah. yeah. Sorry, I apologize. I apologize. We'll bleep. Um, <laughs> Anyone so who knows me won't be surprised. Yeah. Um, so, Late 2000s, Senator Byrd passed uh, the CDSOA, which is the Continued Dumping Offset Subsidies Act. Um, Senator Byrd did something really interesting um, in this legislation. Um, he decided that, um, unlike prior practice, what's going to happen is when a country is found dumping within the United States, the money that they have to pay in duties won't go to the Treasury where it normally goes, but it will actually go to affected domestic producers. Um, Sorry, can I interrupt you for just a second? Yeah, dumping is not literally dumping. <laughs> uh, it's the practice of allegedly selling goods on the market at a artificially reduced price. And hurting the domestic market. Right. Yeah, it's a two. But it's not like literally showing up on our shores with like a big... <laughs> right, yeah. It's a good point. Thank you, Mike. Um, I appreciate it. Um, so anyway, the... Uh, the producers um, and the importers from various countries that were found to be dumping, um, not literally, um, the money that they had to pay in were being distributed to affected domestic producers. That's actually the terminology. Well, as you can imagine, if you know anything uh, you know, about international trade law, some could arguably say that that was our government subsidizing um, our domestic producers, because it was. Um, so the WTO, it actually got up to the WTO. The WTO found, indeed, that's a subsidy. Um, and so the act was repealed. Uh, repealed. But unfortunately, um, our Congress uh, decided not to retroactively repeal it, and they only proactively repealed it. Therefore, we had a slew of cases come up to the Court of International Trade, as you would imagine, arguing about whether or not a given domestic producer would qualify as an affected domestic producer and would receive that money. Um, that money is still being distributed. Um, it was repealed in uh, 2008, maybe, something like that. And so um, we have this in huge line of cases. Um, the cases that we, um, my chambers, have been receiving the most of um, is absolutely fascinating because in order to qualify as a domestic um, affected producer, you have to support the original investigation where uh, dumping was determined to have happened and then receive duties off that investigation. The way in which the International Trade Commission determined, and it was up to them, it was administrative discretion, um, to determine whether or not you would qualify is a standard procedure they always send out to all of the domestic industry when they begin an investigation. Uh, check boxes. Do you support this petition? Do you not support this petition? Neutral. And so if you check the box, dumping was found, you receive distributions. 
Well, some de uh, domestic affected producers don't want to check that box. It could be because they're wholly on subsidiaries of a foreign company that's being investigated. It could be any number of reasons. So they were frustrated in that they felt like they were supporting the petition in that they were giving information, they were, you know, they were um, filling out forms, they were doing everything ITC and DOC were asking of them. They just didn't want to check that box. So someone very creative, a lawyer that I, I love, um, decided to uh, call a First Amendment violation of freedom of speech, that they were actually being forced. Um, there was also due process, but it's not a very good argument. Um, a First Amendment violation, uh, they're violating our free speech. Um, we had a whole bunch of cases come before us to do that. Got appealed up to the CAFC. We held, my chambers, my judge, held that um, it was a First Amendment violation. And guys, I got to tell you, a First Amendment violation of the CIT, this is as sexy as it gets. It doesn't get any better. <laughs> I'm like, we were like, woo, we are hot. Um, so um, it got appealed up to the CAFC. And I remember, as I told you before, the CAFC takes very few of our cases. And then uh, the Supreme Court, forget that. So um, the CAFC took this case, overturned us, said, indeed, this is not the case. They checked the box, no. Um, in a um, phenomenal opinion that they wrote. Um, so it's so ironic that we're actually going up there. It's too funny. Um, but they wrote this opinion um, disagreeing with us. Well, we still have multiple cases before us that now we're in the realm of, of trying to figure out what the opinion's name is SKF, trying to figure out exactly what SKF means. Now we currently have before us another uh, alleged domestic affected producer who checked neutral. And they're like, uh -huh. That's good enough, right? We didn't say no. We just didn't say yes. Um, so that's actually one of the current cases that I'm working on, um, and we'll uh, we'll see how that turns out. Okay. Thank you. Very very interesting all around. So what what uh, questions do you all have about specific kinds of work, career paths, other things? Um, so at, at least in a couple of occasions, we've uh, we've heard that um, to become a good international lawyer, you first want to become a good lawyer. Um, and um, also that to become a good lawyer, you want to get the best training possible, which they've indicated firms are the best way to get there because they have the most resources. I was wondering, in your opinion, uh, in your experience, whether going straight into international law, whether you feel in any way disadvantaged um, in relation to your peers that went straight to firms or what your experience was in, in those terms? Uh, I feel extremely lucky. Uh, I, I think that that is all good advice. And uh, the State Department, like most uh, government agencies, hire relatively few people across the board, and in particular, relatively few people, even among that number, straight out of law school. Um, DOJ has its honors program. Uh, the SEC, I get it confused with the football conference, and then uh, the SEC has a similar program. State Department ha hires a few people straight out of law school and clerkships. But by and large, it's very difficult to get into the federal government directly out of law school or even directly out of a, out of a clerkship. Um, so most of my colleagues in AL spent some time doing something else before they got to AL. They were at firms doing uh, international arbitration or other kinds of international law work. Uh, they were clerking on U.S. courts or at international uh, tribunals of some kind. Um, they were working on fellowships, things like that. Um, and I will admit that there have, especially, you know, when I first came on board, I felt like I was uh, starting a little bit behind people who had had post-law school experience before they joined L because I was figuring out things about how to be a lawyer, not just how to be a State Department lawyer. Um, that some of my colleagues, you know, had, had ironed out uh, previously in their careers. But, um, you know, I, they would not have hired me had they not been reasonably confident that it wouldn't be a liability to them to have somebody straight out of law school. And there are enough positions within AL that really require a sharp, 
mind um, as much as anything else. You know, you're really just sort of issue spotting and the classical things that we learn are sort of part of, of thinking like a lawyer in law school that are sui generis to the law that the State Department practices that you wouldn't have learned the substance of in <laughs> private practice or in another practice somewhere else. You know, there's a lot of things that the State Department does that nobody else does because we are a sovereign and private parties just don't have the same concerns and interests and activities that we do. So uh, there's been, you know, more of a ramping up that I've had to do, um, but, you know, I, this is the job that I wanted, and if I had had to spend a few years in a law firm or doing something else to get to this opportunity, I would have done that. Um, but when I had the opportunity, immediately I jumped at it and I would do it a million times over because uh, this is the job that I wanted and when it was there, I took it. And so I certainly recommend to everybody, you know, go get the best training you can and leverage it into the opportunity you want. But if the opportunity you want is, is there for the taking, you know, I, I would also recommend that you seize it and then just work as hard as you have to, 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 you know, make sure that you, you live up to whatever the expectations are that they have for you. But I, I would have a hard time recommending that you should deliberately pass up the thing that you want because you're, you know, afraid that you're not going to be good enough at it, you know, and you should come back to it later because it might not be there later. I mean, I feel lucky because I don't know if the federal government is going to be hiring anybody for the next 10 years the way that the budget is working. So, you know, I'm, I'm glad that I got in when I did. I would also distinguish between um, being a good lawyer on paper and being a good lawyer in practice. Um, I think that when I, when I think amongst, uh, well, our friends in our graduating class, the vast majority, of course, went to law firms. They're in their second, third year, fourth year associateships, the people that we know. Um, and they are, they're getting phenomenal training and they're making money that we do not make. Um, uh, however, when I think about my friends who are not working for law firms, I'm thinking about us. Another good friend of ours does criminal defense work at uh, Legal Aid um, in Manhattan. Um, our level of responsibility and the things that we have to do compared to what my friends are doing at law firms is just, mind-blowing. Um, it's, it's absolutely unbelievable. The learning curve is intense. The first couple of months of my job were incredible. Because um, you walk through the door and you're expected to be a lawyer and be a lawyer immediately. Um, whereas you might not necessarily get that type of experience in a law firm. So, I mean, you'll look at it on paper. Um, but it, it's different. Um, I mean, my friends are really good at doc review. Like, really good. Um, <laughs> like, great. Um, and you know, and I'm doing different things, and I can honestly tell you right now, I'm a year out, and I am a thousand times better lawyer and a thousand times better writer than I was when I graduated, um, and I was just forced to be because of the job, um, which is a good thing. I'll add to that also because I, um, when I finished law school, I had every summer I had worked for private law firms, and I. It was at a time the economy and the law firm economy was booming, so I split every summer. I worked for six firms in three summers. And, um, and that was, a, that was a, a great era. And, <laughs> but I also, I also what I, I knew that what I was interested in was uh, reg environmental law and regulation and international environmental law. And I clerked for judges for two years, and then I went to the Justice, U.S. Justice Department. Um, and within my first two years at the U.S. Department of Justice, I was working as a member of international uh, treaty negotiating delegations of the kind that Mike Gillis referred to, and, and um, negotiating the text of the Framework Convention on Climate Change. And I also handled three or more cases in the in the federal US federal courts I argued in the Third Circuit, the Eighth Circuit, and the DC Circuit. Um, in the DC Circuit before a panel of Patricia Wall, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, and Clarence Thomas. So that's the that's the kind of responsibility that member just referred to that if you go to work in government right away, it's true that so I think that either can be a very successful coach. I'm not, I don't want to be understood as saying that uh, it's always better to go into government or an intergovernmental organization 
uh, rather than to a private law firm. And um, I think there are really good opportunities in both places, but there is, a, there is an um, immediate immersion in uh, being a f responsible on the front lines for major issues. And also, a lot of my work in the government involved interagency negotiations, that is to say policy development where multiple federal agencies chaired by in, in White House committees were developing what U.S. policy should be on climate change or other issues. And so I worked, spent probably most of my time on, uh, on that. So there's, and I, I can remember sitting in meetings after I'd been working uh, at the Justice Department for a couple of months, realizing that whatever I said in this meeting is going to be attributed to be the position of the United States Department of Justice. <laughs> and the, um, you know, the Attorney General might hear about what I, what I had said. So there is there is both opportunity and pressure in those, in those before, situations. Yeah. But I think for someone who has the, uh, the interest and enthusiasm to do that, there's a very rapid learning curve. And it's, it's a, a very, um, <clears throat> uh, it's a place where, you, where, where one can flourish in, the, in those positions. And, uh, get a lot and give a lot as well. Uh, let me ask, how easy is it to set up a law firm? <laughs> <laughs> and how easy is it to, to get clients? Are they there? And, and culture, you did, clients. Sorry. And you didn't answer the last question, but you did work in private law firms, at least as the technical expert before you uh, I did, and I've worked for the federal government, and I've worked for myself, and um, I'd say to augment what was said earlier to the last question, um, wherever you end up, find a mentor whose opinion you trust and who uh, will help first shepherd you through the organization, whatever organization might be, but also act as a, as a teacher. That's how you learn how to do things the right way. Um, and I, I got very fortunate uh, in that regard and got a good mentor. So um, I think that's what you're looking for, whether you end up in government or a not-for-profit legal aid organization or a law firm or a, as corporate counsel for Exxon. You know, you're, you're, you need somebody above you whose opinion you trust and who's uh, willing to put the time in to, to help you learn. Um, it's easy to set up a law firm. You just talk to the Secretary of State uh, here in North Carolina. If you want to do a trade name, you have to get it approved by the bar. Uh, but no, the clients are tough. That's <laughs> um, I started publishing in 96, I think, and um, started establishing my reputation so over, what, 15 years ago now. And um, that's, you know, you can't advertise in the, the yellow pages for international clients, especially when they're sovereign, sovereign states. Uh, it's word of mouth. Uh, there's a, a trust that has to be built, a reputation that has to be built. The way that I've done it, and it seems to have worked, although it wasn't the fastest track ever, uh, is to publish, and to publish in places where people are, who are your potential clients, are likely to see your name. Um, to attend conferences as a, as a, if you can possibly manage it as a speaker, not just as an audience member. Uh, be prepared to do what I've been doing for the last 15 years, which is going there to the conferences, paying your own way. My first conference in, when I really started looking for this kind of job in international boundaries, I was living in D.C. I was working for the National Marine Fisheries Service, and I, I knew that I wanted to get out of government. No offense, but it wasn't turning me on. Um, so I found a conference in New York City uh, put on by the Center of Oceans Law and Policy at the University of Virginia. And I looked at the speaker list and I said, this is, this, these are my people. This was security flashpoints, maritime security flashpoints. So it was all of the disputed islands throughout Asia and uh, uh, places where oil and gas discoveries had been made, but there were overlapping claims to maritime area. And I said, well, I have to go meet all these people. So I got on a Greyhound bus, I slept on my friend's floor, I paid the extra 85 bucks for the dinner, the gala dinner, so that I could sit with these people and introduce myself to them. I didn't hear any of the papers. I stood by the coffee the whole time with my list, with my list of people who I was going to meet. Ambassador so-and-so, so-and-so, so-and-so. Um, 
and got kind of aggressive and probably a little overly at times. I mean, it's a little bit, it's a cold call. It's a personal cold call. Too much coffee. You don't know, yeah. <laughs> you don't know me, but this is who I am, and I'd like to speak with you about not, the approach can't be give me a job. It's I, this is the area of interest that I have, and, and since you work in this area, I was wondering if you'd take the time to speak with me for a few minutes. And then I followed up with phone calls, and I followed up. I sent my letter, uh, my, uh, my uh, publication out to these people, followed up with phone calls again. And I got my first job at this law firm 10 months after that conference with one of the people I met at the coffee, after about the fifth approach. Um, so that's a start. And then uh, last uh, year and a half ago, I had an email in my spam from the government of Costa Rica saying, would you like to be <laughs> counsel on this case? So these things happen. Now, the, the person who I met at that coffee became my mentor became my boss at the law firm, became the person who said, you got to go to law school, was the person who Costa Rica went to first and said, will you represent us? He said, no, but try Lathrop. So long-term establishment of reputation, uh, put your name out there uh, as an expert in a field, put your name out there as a person who knows what he or she's talking about, speak at conferences if the opportunity arises, join international law organizations, Look for leadership positions within those organizations. Um, I mean, that's, but it's not, it's, get a web page, but, you know, <laughs> that's probably not how the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Country X is going to find their lawyer by an internet search, but it might be the first step. Um, but building a reputation, that, that's, that's how that works. Actually, I want to follow up on the question about setting up a law firm because that's one of the things that law schools really don't teach at all is how you would run a law firm, whether it's your sole practitioner that you put out your shingle or it's uh, if you become the senior partner. Whereas the, the um, stereotype of business schools is that they only teach people how to run the company, that they don't teach people how to uh, be a good team player, or maybe that's changed a lot, but it used to be the, the wrap on. Uh, so if you're, gonna, if you're gonna go work for a law firm or for a large organization like the State Department or the, the US court system or some other established organization, there are all sorts of procedures and record keeping and financial management that are already taken care of. But if you're going to start your own law firm with your own clients, there are issues of record keeping, financial management, um, ethics, uh, attorney-client privilege, keeping client funds, I don't know, there may be others that I'm not thinking of, but... You should probably start how, thinking about this. I should, so I should start thinking about all those. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Does that all work? How terrifying is that, or is that manageable? Look, I'm, I have a laptop <laughs> and an office downtown, which is basically a storage bin for my documents. Um, I don't know that I'm the right guy to be talking about. <laughs> no, but, that, but that's interesting because that shows yeah. how, how both doable and portable or mobile. It can uh, be can very, be. yeah. If your clients are, I mean, my clients are by and large not visiting me in Asheville. <laughs> uh, we have had that happen, but, but, but by and large, I'm going to them. So I don't have the issues of sort of appearance when it comes to the actual brick and mortar uh, part of my firm. Um, if you have expertise and that's what they're paying for, it's all here and it's very portable. Um, ethics, yeah, no. Um, <laughs> the, uh, record Bleak keeping. Uh, um, <laughs> I don't know. I'm, I'm really the wrong person to talk to about the business end of these things. I never really had a business plan. I took an area of expertise and uh, kept my overhead very low with the exception of my Duke Law degrees. Uh, I have no real uh, cost to speak of, um, but uh, yeah, I think it's a little atypical. I'm afraid I'm not very qualified to speak on it. You know, an another advantage on this is in the in some of the international treaty negotiations, um, especially um, smaller or lower income countries. Also, they h hire outside lawyers to represent them as their diplomats. Uh, and I remember in the climate change negotiations, um, the, the small island states who are especially vulnerable to sea level rise had 
essentially hired pro bono lawyers who were law professors from the United States and especially from London. There's a whole cottage industry of British law professors, uh, Philippe Sands most notably, who, um, who were, uh, and it's also more customary in, in the British legal academia for law professors also to have private practices as practicing lawyers, whereas American law professors, typically, that's the main thing they do. Um, but so, so I remember negotiating with uh, the Grenadines and Vanuatu and Tuvalu, and all represented by British lawyers. Uh, it's like model UN or something. <laughs> and, and, well, and another, but another, there was also a substantive implication of that, which was that there was a, a principal agent problem. Um, which is to say that sometimes the client and the agent representing the client don't have the same interests. And in this case, the British public inter international lawyers were mostly interested in the development of public international law as opposed to the interest of protecting their clients from sea level rise. So there was, sometimes you could see the divergence between those, those two interests. Sometimes they were completely consistent. Um, so there are many different ways, and, that, and that's also um, reflects Coulter's point about publishing. I mean, those people got those jobs by being recognized uh, as experts in that field. And they were entrepreneurial about finding, uh, I'm sure that they contacted the client. They, didn't, they weren't waiting uh, to have the client contact them. Mike, I have a quick question. Yeah. So you mentioned that when you, you, you kind of said pestering uh, yes. the people at the State Department. Can you expand upon that a little bit? Yeah, do well, it. How uh, do <laughs> don't pester me, though. I'm not on the hiring committee. Um, I did it respectfully, but I, you know, I think that um, Coulter is right. I think that you need to, when you have the opportunity, cultivate mentors, not just as people that you can learn from, but also people who will go to bat for you. You know, Col this representation that Coulter had uh, for Costa Rica came because. Uh, they went first to his mentor who thought highly enough of, of Coulter to recommend him uh, as the next person in line. And similarly, uh, this is sort of stock advice, but I, I think take it seriously. Your time as a summer associate or intern or whatever is a six-week or eight-week or 12-week job interview. Um, if you... You know, I've, I've been known to procrastinate and work to deadlines uh, on occasion, and law school in its basic structure can lend itself to that when all you have to do is make sure that you turn your exam in on time and learn the material shortly before you do it. Uh, but if you're that kind of person, which I sometimes am, don't be that person when you're a summer associate. I mean, be on your best behavior, be as impressive as you possibly can be, because when you leave at the end of the summer and call two weeks or four weeks or six weeks or eight weeks later and say, you know, I really want to come back and work for you. I had a, you know, great experience and think that I could be valuable. They're not going to take your word for it. They're going to go talk to the people that you worked for um, and ask them whether you're the kind of person that they should invest in because you will be an asset, you know, down the road. And so I think that there were um, people that I worked for when I was an intern at the State Department during my 2L summer, you know, who I made a point of trying to do my best work for them, really, you know, asking them for advice on if I want to work here, you know, who do I need to do talk to, what do I need to do um, to, to get that opportunity. And I think it paid off when, um, you know, a couple months later after I had left and I was a name on a piece of paper in the, the hiring committee's office that when I would call, you know, and say, uh, bending the truth a little bit because on, for better or worse, Williams and Connolly doesn't make offers. So I didn't have any leverage. Um, they, it, it's sort of a handshake system, but I, so I, I sort of tried to imply to the State Department that you know, they were gonna lose out on a good thing if they couldn't make a decision quickly enough. Um, it wasn't true, uh, <laughs> but you know, I, I, 
I, I, I tried to do what I could to sort of remind them, you know, look, I'm really interested, you know, please make a decision soon. Um, and I'm sure, you know, that their internal process was uh, to, in some way, access the, the people that had worked with me directly when I was there and figure out whether, you know, I was the kind of person among all the people they were considering um, who would be worthwhile to have uh, as a full-time person and uh, and so I, I think that it's important to not you know don't don't be afraid to ask for what you want uh, if, as long as you're doing it respectfully and and, and realistically um, you, you know but it's it's okay to be persistent um, and I think you, you need to be persistent because um, most people aren't you know, most people will send a thank you email, and if they never hear anything back, we'll just sort of assume that, you know, their odds are what they are. And um, quite often the opportunity will go to the person who takes the next step um, or the, the step after that. Um, and there are lots of niches um, that are not necessarily filled. Lots of people within the United States government, both at the State Department and elsewhere, have um, sort of off the books positions that are special assistant positions or, or things that are sort of hired for and funded through channels that are not the monolithic USA Jobs website that lists every job in the entire federal government, you know, and you need to wade through and, you know, say, I want to be a lawyer and not sort of a chicken health inspector or something. Um, but, you know, if, if, if there's it, literally, you know, if there's somebody that you want to work for at the State Department, not even in, in Al, you know, one of the, the people who works on a particular policy area that you're interested in, send them a letter that says, hey, I wrote about the intersection of your work and the law in my student <coughs> note. Here it is. I'd love to talk to you about it. Um, do you need a special assistant next year and they might not but they they might and I guarantee that you're one of the few people who you know took the time to ask I would add that to that too that the world of law can be very small but the world of international law is so small um, the people um, that you see you'll see again and again when I was um, summering with Hogan I think three or four of the partners that I worked for regularly appear before us at the court. Um, I see them all the time. I made friends when I was at Hogan with um, Ambassador Hayes, who negotiated GATT for the U.S. and had recently joined Hogan, and she's still a friend of mine, somebody that I can be in touch with. Um, it, it's building on everything that has been said, but it, it's true. You reach out to the people that you possibly can. Um, and, and, and use those connections and ask, and very, very politely and very charming, push um, <laughs> as hard as you can. The, I was surprised this year from Duke that um, clerkship applications to our court, I think only two people from Duke applied, which was I thought was really surprising, especially since, I mean, I would, if I were you, I would apply to me, um, <laughs> if you know what I mean. Um, I would apply to, to those chambers and make those connections. They, they do matter. They, they just do. Um, and there are ways that, that you can get in touch with people in that various ways. And, and there's nothing wrong with that. Um, it's a good idea. So pester without being a pest. Yes. Uh, but, and I want to add two other things. One is that, um, the, in my experience, energy level counts for a lot. So there are all sorts of qualifications that people have on their resumes, uh, where they went to school and what other jobs they had and what the uh, maybe GPA or something like that that people put on their resumes. But none of that can communicate uh, how much energy and initiative someone will bring to, uh, to working in an organization. And so, it's, so, that, so being able to uh, exhibit that, whether it's in the summer associate position or in an interview, um, that you are motivated and enthusiastic and, and then follow through on that. I think that um, uh, matters enormously. And the second point is that I want to add is that uh, without adding pressure to your years in law school, you should think of law school as a three-year or one-year job interview uh, also if you're in the JD or LLM or or other program, in the sense that your professors will be the people who write you recommendation letters for clerk, judicial clerkships or State Department or other 
kinds of positions, foreign ministry positions, and law firm jobs, they'll make, they, they will make uh, personal contacts or they may often know the lawyers in each of these kinds of organizations. And sometimes your law professor, him or herself, will become that person. So I got to work in the Justice Department um, in part because one of my professors from law school was appointed the head of the division, uh, presidential appointee. That's unusual, but that can happen. So, um, and then he hired me as his special assistant, just the kind of position right. that you were referring to, not through the honors program, but, through, but as his special assistant, which meant that I could do whatever he and I thought was important. So, um, so those relationships in law school can, can be uh, valuable in multiple ways as well. Yeah, the, the halls of Al are stocked currently by an obscenely large number of Yale Law graduates uh, in partial, partially due to the fact that the current legal advisor is uh, Harold Coe, who was the former dean of Yale Law School. So I suggest that uh, we nominate <laughs> Professor Weiner uh, or, you know, <laughs> somebody else. No, but, but, but those, those, those personal connections with, with anybody who, you know, peer connections as well as, as sort of senior or junior relationships, I think, get people uh, a long way um, in various, various situations, so. I'm curious whether um, any of you have worked, uh, it could be summer position or a more full-time position, have worked in um, areas of international law or anything related to what we've been discussing today, because you may have stories or insights to add up as well. Yeah? I mean, I don't know if I have any stories or insights to add, but because they've said everything so well, but <laughs> I worked at the Court of International Trade last summer. And Ari did a phenomenal job. <laughs> he was a great intern. Yeah. She's obviously exaggerating. <laughs> um, but yeah, I, I, I found the, the issue is very interesting. Um, and it is, even though it's international, uh, it touches on international issues, it's a lot about basically interpreting statutes and applying the statutes to these different trade issues. So, for what it's worth, be ready to interpret statutes in international context. <laughs> well, Ari's funny too because uh, when he first started working at the court this past summer, he came up to me, I was walking out of chambers, and he was like, hey, Amber, it's nice to see you again. And I'm like, oh, I don't remember. Um, and it turns out that Ari had, when we were three else, Ari, his uh, 1L year, attended the final JDLM dinner when you and I gave um, those, those very festive speeches. Um, and uh, I had mentioned something about the Court of International Trade and that that's where I was headed. Uh -huh. And uh, so ended up um, interning with us. Um, and I was not exaggerating. I talked to your clerks. They said you did a phenomenal job. I don't exaggerate <coughs> often. What's the breakdown here of 1Ls, 2Ls, 3Ls? 1Ls? Wow. 2Ls? <laughs> 3Ls? <laughs> Our friends. And LLMs. LLMs. Oh, great. Yeah, oh, sorry, okay. Yes. All, right, All right, good. And, okay. And JD LLMs, pretty much everybody, except yeah. for the people who are just straight up LLMs. Okay. And a few JDs. A few JDs. All right. Hey guys. Uh, no, well, I'm actually really excited to see so many 1Ls uh, because you have a lot of opportunities ahead of you to put into practice all the things you're going to hear in this series of speeches. And because there are so many 1Ls, one thing that I'll recommend that was sort of just beginning and came along too late for me to really take advantage of, uh, but the Duke and DC program, um, a lot of government agencies and nonprofits in DC are actually extremely competitive to get into over the summer. They just have very small classes, um, and it's it's hard. It can be hard to get a summer internship. It can be much easier to get a, a school term internship or externship, um, and you're there for much longer. So in terms of ease of getting the position and the impression that you're able to make in terms of taking on projects that maybe couldn't be completed in a seven-week internship but can be completed in a 14-week time frame and the number of people you can work with and the experience you can have. Um, you know, if it fits into your overall plans, I really strongly recommend you uh, think about the Duke and DC program or other ways to extern as well as 
intern um, because getting in the door is almost always the hardest part about getting the job you want. And externships, uh, I think, are a underutilized, um, really high-value way to do that. Um, that uh, I strongly encourage you to think about how you can do that in the next two and a half years. Um, so, so the DTLM, well, I'll forgive you. Uh, what kind of jobs did you get uh, your first summer and before going to institute? I mean, you did We Start. Yeah. Uh, what kind of jobs would you like recommend for us to look for? What did you do? I worked for myself. Yeah. <laughs> Go work for Coulter. <laughs> <laughs> Um, it's tough to schedule around the summer institutes, I found. Uh, I um, got married that summer as well, uh, so I uh, was not in a position to take a job abroad during the first half of the summer and then hang around for the summer institute. Um, I Most of our classmates did that, though, um, Jennifer and her office uh, were able to place pretty much everybody who wanted to work in either Europe or um, Asia in a law firm job, um, usually with a international LLM alumnus uh, or alumna of the law school as sort of the, the bridging contact there. And I think that's a great idea. I mean, it gets you law firm experience your first summer, which isn't something that's terribly easy to come by in the US. It gets you international experience. Mm -hmm. It can get you language experience, um, and it's just, I think, mostly a really fun thing to do. Um, I, we had other colleagues who were able to get uh, firm jobs in Raleigh for the first half of that summer before they came to the summer institutes. I think those were relatively rare. There are some really interesting opportunities here at the law school, though, whether it's working as a research assistant or working in one of the clinics. Yeah, I, uh, I was working in the wrongful convictions clinic uh, for the, with Teresa Newman. And picking up what we were talking about earlier, um, I'm not sure I would have gotten in the door um, at my court without the recommenders that I had from Duke Law. Uh, Teresa Newman, Jamie Boyle went to bat for me, um, hardcore. Um, and uh, it was very impressive. And Teresa did as well, and I met her that summer working for her before I went to Hong Kong. The plan was to go, I used to live, I lived in Beijing for a couple of years, and the plan was to go back there, but it didn't work out what, what I was planning on doing. Um, and I'm glad because she uh, she's a big part of my life, and, and she, her recommendations made a really big deal. Um, so that's what I did. Um, I wouldn't underestimate interning either. Um, I mean, my court would take an intern for the first half of the summer, um, depending on Chamber's policy, uh, before you go to Hong Kong or Geneva. Um, and that's, that's an opportunity right there if that's something you're interested in doing. Yeah, and judicial internships are pretty popular among 1LJ DLMs. I mean, if you're interested in public international law, um, Europe is the place to be. And if you're going to be in the Geneva program anyway, I think this isn't what I did, but my advice would be to write it off as a summer where you won't be making any money and uh, go experience one of the institutions in Europe uh, for a month or two before you do the Geneva program. Um, the International Law Commission sits in Geneva during much of that time. I don't know go watch the process. If you can get on board with the U.S. or some other country rep and, and be their bag carrier, that's going to be a great experience. Mm -hmm. uh, the ICJ is based in The Hague, the International Criminal Court. You've got ITLOS, the International Tribunal for the Law of the Sea, in Hamburg, Germany. Um, you've got the WHO uh, in Geneva, if you're into you know international uh, health policy issues. Um, but if you're into public international law, I think I would plan on going over there and paying your way to have an experience for a couple of months. That would be my choice over going to a U.S. law firm for a month or two. Um, Asheville's nice there, right? Asheville's not hiring at the moment, but... <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I'm broke. I, I, just came from New York. <laughs> and I worked in the corporate world. And yeah. I know that I make 
made more money than <laughs> most clerks their first year, and I had a tough time. So. Yeah. Uh, the government pays better than the court system does, the federal government in Washington, The court system pays better than you think, Yeah. Uh, especially after your first couple of years. Um, I just bumped into my second year, and um, <laughs> needed that, and, then I, and, I, and I guess I'm going to be moving into the third year when it starts getting really pretty. Um, not only lost for I'm pretty, but it's in a pretty fur. Um, and so... Um, we, this is actually a discussion that we had a great deal when we were, we, I mean, because both of us split between government and law firms in D.C., our two L summers, and the discussion of where we were going to go, what we were going to do, and how we were going to afford to do that. Um, you manage. You do. I mean, I am. I'm, I'm, I'm in New York. I live in the Lower East Side. I, it's expensive. It's, like, really expensive. But you do. You manage. Um, and uh, the loan for beginning forgiveness programs, the income-based repayments, uh, the 10-year forgiveness if you do 10 years of law work um, that's not at a law firm. Um, the, 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 the legislature has helped us out. Um, it has nothing to do with the fact that the legislature is actually lawyers. Um, it's, uh, I mean, it's doable. And I can honestly tell you there is nothing I would rather be doing than what I'm doing. I love clerking. I love my judge. I love trade law. I, it's too much fun. Um, my friends hate me because I'm so happy. Um, but they only get to see me after midnight anyway because they're at work. <laughs> Do you think that this relates also to the earlier question about whether to start at a law firm versus starting in government or nonprofit? Because the the income uh, trajectory is so different. Do you think, from your own experience or from uh, those of your friends, that if you start in a private law firm and you're making a much higher salary? that that becomes the lifestyle to which one is accustomed and then it's more difficult to take it. It really depends on who you are. I have colleagues at L now who worked in law firms for one to three years before they joined L, and I think that to the extent that they always knew that that was a temporary path to you know, a, a career in government or in academia or someplace that they weren't going to be making that kind of money you know, uh, straight out of the gate, um, they were able to condition their sort of the way that they they dealt with that temporary high salary in a way that I think is maybe more difficult uh, for people who go to law firms uh, and only realize after having been there for a little while that it's not a sustainable lifestyle and look for something to do next if you you know if you've really been living like you're always going to be making uh, 160 or 80 or two hundred thousand dollars a year and then all of a sudden have to downsize I think it's very <coughs> different than if you go in understanding that you know you're temporarily making 200 percent of what your real salary is going to be when you when you take a more sustainable career. But I, you know, I, realistically, everybody's financial situation is different. You know, to without giving you our spreadsheets, you know, I, the, the way that I was able to finance my law degree, coupled with my salary and our sort of household situation, makes it uh, reasonably comfortable for me to have the job that I have and and feel like you know we're we're frugal but not killing ourselves um, to be where we are. I think that I have classmates who, through no fault of their own, just aren't in that situation. And I will say, you know, that uh, more often than not, I find that people I know who work in low-paying public interest jobs have a second household income that is substantially higher. And if you're lucky enough to be in that situation, then, you know, Go That's that. great if you're not lucky. <laughs> if you're not lucky enough to be in that situation, then you you figure out another way. Um, but you know there are a lot of two lawyer households where one has the the save the world job and the other has the buy the Benz job, and um, you know that's that's just the reality of the situation. So. But I'm, I mean, I'm married to uh, a woman <laughs> sitting in the back of the room who is uh, in public health and also endeavors to save the world on a daily basis. So, you know, we've, we've made it work uh, on that. that yeah. So we will not be buying bins. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, and my wife and I lived 
uh, well, she worked for a, a nonprofit social services for the uh, for aging for the elderly. So we had a two a two public yeah. it was public sector, yeah. and we lived on Capitol Hill, and that was great. Yeah. Uh, we live on Capitol Hill. And this is, this is getting York, eerie. When I lived in New York, <laughs> when I lived in, New York we, I lived in Brooklyn. Um, when I lived in Manhattan, that, I lived with my grandmother. <laughs> <laughs> All of a sudden, Brooklyn looks so much better. Brooklyn was terrific. I yeah. I love Brooklyn. I love living on Capitol Hill. I love those six law firms. If I had, if I had wanted to do, it was the kind of work that that got me to work in government. That I wanted to work on environmental and regulatory issues and see regulatory policy made from the inside and international negotiations from the inside. Because if otherwise, if I had wanted to do. Uh, corporate mergers and acquisitions, I would have gone to Wachtell Lipton, which was the law firm I worked for uh, one of my last summers. Or if I wanted to do litigation in, um, to use Amber's term, the, the sexiest litigation, I would have gone back to LA, where I worked for my second summer. Um, so there, it was really the kind of work, I think. And my, my reaction, or my advice on a lot of these questions is, to the extent that you can afford it, uh, do do what you think is the most interesting, and that will not the not the stepping stone to the next thing or the most the highest salary, but the most interesting, and that will lead you to work with the people who will be your great mentors and recommenders, and will you'll find the network of the kinds of things you're interested in, and you'll be much more motivated to do it, and that motivation will then be visible to others. Any other other questions? Do we have do we have a little any refreshments or cookies left over? Uh, I think there are, we might. There are a few things in the back. So there. let's Absolutely. let's uh, thank Oleg for organizing this and thank our three thank you. speakers. Produced by Duke University. Online at duke.edu.